Good evening. Welcome to North Bend High School. My name is Mr. Mike Boyer. I'm a technology and engineering educator here at North Penn. Um, I also am an educator in the Engineering Academy. And this evening I'm going to share with you the work that 21 students have been doing this year throughout the entire year uh, regarding engineering research and nanotechnology research. So I'm really excited to share with you. And I would like to start off with a little bit of background information because there's some visitors here who might not be familiar with the Engineering Academy. So the Engineering Academy here at North Penn started in 1999. Um, we have a five course sequence. In the sophomore year, we offer two courses, Introduction to Engineering Design or Principles of Engineering, which are geared for engineering physics and 3D solid mechanical engineering style work. The SIM class, Computer Integrated Manufacturing and Digital Electronics, are junior year courses. And these courses are designed to introduce students into the manufacturing world um, and taking a look at programming and things of that nature and in the digital electronics world, we look at electrical engineering materials. What you're going to see this evening are students who are actually working in the engineering design and development course, EDD. And these students have been taking a look at a, a ton of different information. They focus on the engineering design process. So from an engineering standpoint, all of the things in the world that we take for granted, all of the amazing materials and work that we, that we have and we use or these products, start off with a concept or an idea from an engineer saying, we have a problem, we need to solve it. So we take a look at what is the problem, we justify it, we go through the generating mobile solutions, selecting and developing a particular solution, constructing and testing prototypes, reflecting and evaluating, and ultimately what these students will be doing this evening is presenting the work they've performed. So this is the EDD course in a nutshell. It's similar to many engineering universities that have a senior year course where they take everything they've learned for the first several courses and put it together in the end. So we teach, or I teach in this course in particular, nanotechnology along with the engineering research and design. And when we take a look, you can kind of see up here some examples of images, and each of the teams are going to share with you the work that they do. So how did nanotechnology get into North Penn? I mean, it's, there's no other schools anywhere that I know of that are teaching the type of nanotechnology work that we do. And it started with, for me, uh, the opportunity that in 2003, I got an email from Drexel University. And Drexel had sent an email saying, any interested teachers who want to get involved in a summer research program? And I thought, wow, this would be really cool. So I signed up because I was teaching digital electronics at the time. And I'm like, wow, I'll sign up for this digital work. And meanwhile, Dr. Frank Coe, this gentleman right here, sent me an email. He's like, Mike, I'm going to be in China. But guess what? You're in, and I want you to read this research paper. And so he's like, Ultra electrostatic fabrication of ultrafine conducting fibers, polyaniline, polyethylene oxide blends. <laughs> <laughs> That was me. <laughs> and I looked at it and then I said, ultrafine fibers of polyaniline dope with camphor sulfonic acid. Now I didn't say that I went but in the head of the acid. I didn't know what that was. I was really like, oh my gosh. And I said to my wife, I said, honey, look at this email. I don't know if I can do this. She goes, well, how would your students feel if you told them that you weren't going to take this opportunity? I'm like, you're right. So, so she was really good and she, she coached me on it. So I, I took the opportunity and I went to Drexel and I learned about a lot of amazing things. It was a five week program in the summer. I learned about material science. I learned about the fact that material science in particular is a convergence of many different disciplines. So if you have a child who wants to be an engineer but they're like, oh, I don't know what field of engineering I want to get into. I like electrical, I like mechanical, I maybe even like chemical. Material science might be a field for them because it is a true convergence of every discipline, which is really exciting. So when I teach the students about a little bit about material science, which many of them are getting involved with because they're changing the properties of materials, they look at forces. Did you ever think of temperature as a force? You know, you think if I push on something. But how about temperature? Temperature is a force, in particular temperature difference is what causes wind and many other factors. Mechanical stress, chemical reaction, electrical fields, magnetism, these are all forces that can change properties of materials when we put them in and we can use them for particular applications. So I asked my students, what forces can we apply to our research materials to change their properties so we can get them to do what you want them to do? Because in material science, it's all about taking something and making it stronger, faster, lighter, sharper, smarter. 
And so when you see these students in their research study, you'll see how they were inspired by the same materials. So a quick overview, because I won't go too deep into nanotechnology, plus it's a small subject. But <laughs> nano, I'm coming from the Greek word, the Greek word dwarf, um, is a creation of functional materials. In other words, we, we make things that actually perform some type of function, they actually do something. Systems through working on the nanometer scale. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. It's hard to imagine a billionth of anything, or a billion of anything for that matter. But a billionth of a meter is so small the human eye can't see it. The wavelength of visible light, if you were to look at light traveling in waves, the distance from the start to end of one wavelength, which we can't even see, is 400 to 700 nanometers. These students are working with materials that are smaller than that, 100 nanometers and less, which is pretty amazing. So some examples. The head of a pin is a, is a million nanometers. Ragweed pollen, 20,000 nanometers. Red blood cell, maybe 2,500 nanometers. And then something we call carbon nanotubes. Only two nanometers. Pretty interesting. So if a nanometer is so small, how can we see? How can we see something that small? We can't see it. We can't use an optical microscope like we do in chemistry. So we can't see them. We use something called a scanning electron microscope. It uses electrons to image something, not light, which is really cool. These students have had their hands on one of these. The SEM right up here, you can see one of our students uh, that was currently working on one. And actually, we have from Angstrom Scientific and Hitachi, we have an SEM demonstration tonight for you guys to see what they look like and how they work. They're really amazing. Um, and so you can see an example of what pollen looks like. So you see the pollen on the B, and here you can see what it looks like under higher magnification. It's pretty amazing. So these students are using the SEM to see things that are typically invisible while they're researching. It's pretty cool. I also teach electrospinning, spinning, which is something that I learned at uh, Drexel University. And electrospinning spinning is a process of applying a charge, and you'll hear more tonight about this, but applying a voltage or a charge to a liquid polymer, a liquid plastic, a plastic in a liquid state. And then when we apply a voltage to it, we can actually create ultra-fine fibers. These are seen under magnification. To the naked eye, they look like just a tissue. But these guys are looking at ways to functionalize them. Can we get fabric like this to squeeze it and generate a voltage? Wouldn't it be cool if the heat that your body's giving off right now could charge your cell phone? Well, students today are starting to take a one step towards that. They're going to talk to you about thermoelectric materials. Or the fact that you're just walking in your shoes can generate enough voltage to maybe charge a cell phone or some other electrical component. Piezoelectric materials, and another team doing that. And you'll see seven teams plus a NASA research team I'll share with you soon, too. So, when I was at Drexel and I spent four summers there learning about material science and engineering and nanotechnology, I fell in love with the engineering research process. Now, at this point, I was only teaching digital electronics. I wasn't teaching EDD. However, the teacher who was teaching EDD at the time retired, and they asked who would like to teach this course. I'm like, me, me, me. I would like to teach it because I, I was thinking about, wow, I can parallel the engineering design development course with the nanotechnology research I learned at Drexel. And so this program was born from that. But something I saw in 2008 when I was up at MIT in the summer for a workshop, um, I saw Dr. Joe DeSimone open up on stage. He got a half a million dollar check on stage. I'm like, wow. And he said, a vision without resources is just a hallucination. So you can have all the vision in the world. You can have the drive, the motivation. But if you don't have the resources, and most people think of resources as time and money, but it's a lot more than that. It's knowing the right people. It's having the right connections. It's knowing where to find information when you need it. And these students this year have learned to become what I call autodidactic, learning for information and learning for the sake of learning and then using it to apply to their problem. It's really cool. So these are the organizations that have given money to our program. I've written for grants over the past 11 years that I've been teaching this course. And uh, we've gotten over $60,000. One of our big supporters, not just Dow Chemical, who last year gave us 30,000, and, and many of these other companies that have given us so much money, that I'm just, I'm so humbled. Um, the North Penn Ed Foundation has been amazing. They give us money every single year. And without them, we couldn't do our research, because we have all the equipment, but we can't get the polymers and all the other materials. And so we're really thankful for the North Penn Ed Foundation for all of their work, and just found out today that I got two more grants for EDD next year 
we're going to do virtual reality work and have another set of funds to pay for research materials. So I definitely want to thank the North Penn Ed Foundation for all of their work. We couldn't do what we do without them. So a lot has happened since 2005. We started with, well, what is electrospinning? What happens if I change the voltage? And you'll learn more about this in the gym tonight. To, well, how can we get a material to generate electricity when we heat it or squeeze it? Or what, how can we put one nanofiber inside another? First of all, they're so small you can't see it, but what if we put one inside another? What could it do? And these students will talk to you about that this evening as well. So, what's next? Every year it gets crazier and more exciting and we dig deeper and we, we dare to dream and try amazing new endeavors. This year we're finishing up year one of a three-year grant. We were part of a, the Space Grants Consortium. We were invited by Montgomery County Community College and J.J. Ramon, one of the uh, professors there, to actually do research, to actually develop hydrophobic nanofibers or coatings that resist water and you'll learn about this this evening, for space flight and for autonomous vehicle research. So these students are doing some really amazing research. So the sky's the limit. This is year one out of three years. Who knows what's going to happen next? We're so thankful for all these opportunities. So I thank you for the time to hear a little bit about the intro of our program, but I want to move it on so you can see what the students have been doing this year. So at this time, I'd like to hand it off to Thermotech, our first research team that's going to share with you about thermoelectric materials and their research. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Namek Williams, this is Bailey Harp, and this is Abdul Nahim, and we are at Thermotech. 98.6 degrees. That's the temperature that an average human body works at any given time. Albert Einstein said that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And as we know, heat is also a form of energy. And most of the energy, heat energy is just being wasted. And human body is just one example of all the things around us just, that just waste heat energy. Luckily, however, Einstein also said that energy can be transformed into different forms of energy. And that's where thermal electricity comes in. Thermal electricity is harvested by a thermal electric generator. This is a market thermal electric generator. A thermal electric generator works by taking two dissimilar materials and passing a change in heat through them. That change in heat excites electrons and then produces electricity. After beginning our research into thermal electric generators, we decided that the next step would be to design our own. After going through many different thermoelectric polymers and metals, we settled on a polymer called P.PSS. After learning about its uh, thermoelectric properties and its cost efficiency, that is what we landed on. So at first, we thought of uh, painting the P.PSS on car stock with just paintbrush. But then we realized that uh, if, we don't, if, we, if we're not careful, we, we can just mess the lines up. So we decided to, take, uh, decided to make uh, masks out of uh, card, uh, cardboard and then card stocks and then we uh, cut, it, cut them out with laser cutter and put, put them on the card stocks and then we painted over it. Then uh, throughout our research we upgraded to plexiglass masks so that we can put thicker arrays of PSS on card stocks. So we then went to painting our, our cardstocks, which we took a paintbrush and painted fine, thin films of P.PSS through our masks and all the arrays. This allowed the arrays to be uniform and thus equal. After painting our P.PSS and our silver paste onto our cells, we had to begin the process of annealing. The annealing process bonded the P.PSS with our cardstock cell and also the silver paste with the PIS to get a good electrical connection. So this is our final product. After a year of research and experiments, we finally made a cell that works. But, but um, because of in inefficiency in the cell, we didn't have um, in uh, sufficient data to come to a good conclusion. So the future of our cell 
is finding a way to make the cell more efficient. And with a more efficient cell, um, more efficiency can be characterized when finding out how the cell works. And that will come with more resources and more time. Thank you. We would now like to bring up Pisa Tech. My name is Dominic DiBerardino, this is TJ O'Hagan, and this is Thomas, Thomas Dixon, and we're Piso Tech. According to the Energy Information Administration, 81% of all electricity generated in the U.S. is created from burning fossil fuels, and only 10% is from renewable energy sources such as hydroelectric power or solar power. We can change that percentage if we utilize piezoelectric materials. So what is a piezoelectric material? Well, it's a material that while you apply a force to it, it generates a voltage. This only happens though if the, vol if the pressure is changing. So if it remains constant, the voltage stops. The way a piezo uh, piezoelectric material works is if you apply a stress to it, it aligns the electrical structure of the material specifically to allow electrical current to flow through the material. We can extract this by using uh, ex uh, electrodes on the outskirts of the material. So some current applications that this technology could be used for is anything from roof shingles, so like rain, sleet, or hail would apply pressure to it and it would generate voltage from that otherwise wasted energy or the flooring in buildings or anywhere from all the footsteps or putting any pressure on the flooring is currently wasted. And we could do this by creating these products using um, piezoelectric materials such as nanofibers or what we research, thin films. Uh, so to produce these thin films, we use a process called spin coating. And how spin coating works is uh, flat so you attach a flat surface to a motor and you spin the motor at a standard speed of 3,000 RPMs and you drop your solution and as the flat surface spins, uh, the excess solvent pushes to the side and as it continues to spin, uh, the remaining solvent evaporates and you're left with a pure uh, thin film of your polymer. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, some initial testing, uh, the film is very uneven, a wavy look, not uniform at all. Uh, so to fix this, you research a process called annealing. Annealing is the process of heating a material up to just below its melting temperature, where it starts to go through a phase change, but you stop it before then, it then solidifies and changes the structure of your thin films. So we chose to anneal because after reading through several research paper, we saw that the best way to improve our thin film quality was through annealing it. So as you can see on this picture, this is before we anneal it, and you see all those ripples, and it doesn't look very similar throughout the entire thin film. But after we anneal it here, you can see it looks almost identical throughout the whole film. After we annealed, we found a common structure throughout the whole, all of our films, and that was a honeycomb structure. And we believe this honeycomb structure will allow an electrical current to flow through with less resistance than a non-annealed thin film. So we decided to test our thin films by producing these piezoelectric tabs. So these are produced by using two uh, layers of uh, silver paste as electrodes on the outsides and then multiple layers of our piezoelectric thin films in between. We had to use multiple layers because if the electrodes touch each other, it would short the tab out and it wouldn't produce anything. The way we went about testing our, thin, our tabs was we took a factory-made tab, as seen on your right, and we hooked it up to an oscilloscope and applied different amounts of stress to the film. We then did the same test to our films and compared the results. Uh, so if we had uh, more time, we would embed uh, zinc oxide nano, zinc oxide particles into our solution to increase the piezoelectric effect. 
We would also continue to improve our process of our thin films to make it the best that we could, and as well as experiment with more annealing times to see if a greater time would improve our film quality. Thank you, and we'd like to hand it over to Nano Medical uh, Solutions. Hello, my name is Tom Gerhardt, and my name is Brian Long. Together, we make Nano Medical Solutions. This evening, we will discuss with you the new methodologies in the field of healthcare as well as new ways to treat traumatic wound injuries. According to the CDC, 2,639,901 people are hospitalized in the U.S. in 2014 due to traumatic injuries. Additionally, according to JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, 9% of all deaths worldwide are a result of traumatic wound injuries, and 90% of those deaths occur in low to middle income countries due to inadequate health care. According to the Abington Jefferson Health Network, wound treatments tend to be the same for every patient, except for those with diabetes, circulation or collagen issues, and autoimmune diseases. Current methods for a successful healing process include cleaning bacteria from the wound, closing or wrapping the, root, the wound and letting it heal naturally, and eating enough protein and getting into fighting resiliency. Our overall goal this year was to combine multiple cutting edge technologies into a uniform bandage that could ultimately improve the healing process in several aspects. These five research papers educated us on the methods required to achieve our goal. The five research topics are, one, a cellular scaffold, two, medicinal encapsulation, three, microencapsulation, four, core sheath nanofibers for medicinal purposes, and five antibacterial uh, antifibers. A cell cellular scaffold allows the wound to heal quicker, which also decreases the chance of infection. This diagram represents the functionality of the cellular scaffold. As you can see, the scaffold allows newly produced cells to grow within the boundaries of the fibers rather than exclusively off the surface of the wound. The Zeiss optical image on the left allowed us to visualize our PCL nanofibers. The SEM image on the right allowed us to quantify our PCL nanofibers. PCL, also known as polycaprolactin, is biodegradable and promotes a healthy and successful cellular scaffold. The image at the bottom of the screen shows our PCL cellular scaffold after the electrospinning process. The purpose behind medicinal encapsulation is to embed vesicles containing medicine into the fibers to be introduced directly into the bloodstream through the wound. The image on the left shows our encapsulation process. The solution within the syringe reacts within the solution in the larger beaker to form vesicles trapping the proxin and deionized water into the vesicles as seen in the image at the top right. This image shows our capsules on a glass slide ready for optical microscope analysis. Microencapsulation combines methods from both medicinal encapsulation as well as cellular scaffolds to form fibers that trap particles of naproxen within them. This is an SEM image of our fibers. The large particles that obtrude from the fibers are naproxen particles. This is an elemental analysis of our fibers. The specks you see represent sodium. Because naproxen is the only component we use that contains any sodium, the sodium also represents the naproxen. This, this is an SEM image of crushed up naproxen sodium. These particles end up within the nanofibers and release into the bloodstream during the fibers degradation process. Core sheath nanofibers serve as the same purpose as microencapsulated nanofibers, but provide more medicine to the wound and more control over the degradation period. The image on the left is a fiber that we believe to be core sheath. The fiber is comprised of a PEO, or polyethylene oxide, sheath, and a PVA, or polyvinyl alcohol core, or the additive of the proxy. This is a frontal view of our coaxial core sheath needle that we purchased from Rami Barton. 
As you can see, there's a needle within a needle, which allows us to electrospin two separate polymers into one uniform fiber. The outer needle supplies the sheath, while the inner needle supplies the core. Antibacterial nanofibers keep the wound from becoming infected. Our fibers were comprised of PVA and a very small concentration of silver nitrate. Silver nitrate can be harmful to the body in large concentrations. Therefore, we utilized 0.01% silver nitrate in all of our solutions. This concentration was deemed safe by many research papers. These images show the final bandage assembly process. However, we did not need to include all of our methods in order to produce a bandage that supplies antibacterial properties, a cellular scaffold, and medicinal release. This diagram shows our final bandage. As you can see, we applied our PCL cellular scaffold on top of the cotton patch on a fibrous bandaid. We then followed by adding our core sheath nanofibers on top of the PCL cellular scaffold. And then as our final layer, we added our antibacterial fibers. These layers can be differed in thickness to adjust the fibers degradation times, as well as the bandages applications. If we had more time, we would research the concentrations of naproxen and silver nitrate within our fibers. And we would also study degradation times of our fibers. With clinical studies, we could have gathered sufficient data regarding our concentration testings and degradation times of our fibers. Thank you, and we'd now like to introduce MT Bioscience. still a great issue for, for our nation and worldwide. And these are some news articles that I just recently pulled up two weeks ago discussing how water has been affecting people around the world. I'm Tommy Novia, and this is my research partner, Mash, and together with MT Bioscience. 783 million people do have access to safe drinking water in, this, in the world. And about 85% of the world's population is in, lives in the driest half of the planet. There are many current solutions to this problem, and you can see here the solutions may seem very affordable. For life to about twenty dollars, ceramic filters range from seven fifty to thirty dollars, and the eating of missio is at fifty dollars. However, the global median income is about thirteen thousand dollars per year, which means uh, yeah, which means most people cannot afford these items. The way to combat that, what we found was that a polyurethane foam, if you embed silver nanoparticles into it, would not only filter out water effectively, but would only cost about 75 cents altogether for one inch. And if you were to think about it, that's the memory foam that some, some people sleep on. Our method to create a solution is to first take silver nitrate, mix it with deionized water, and then boil it. Until, and once it boils, we then add a, a citrate solution we turn the heat until it turns yellow. And once it's yellow, we then cool it down for a day, and then we soak the film. For our first experiment, we used silver nitrate and an SSD buffer, and the solution actually turned pink when it was supposed to turn yellow. And after the testing, we actually found the quality, quality to be lower than we expected. And for a second experiment, we got the assistance of Mrs. Nina from our chemistry department. And she helped us prepare a citric acid solution used instead of the buffer. However, the solution didn't change color at all, and we needed to make another solution. Finally, for our third experiment, we actually used the trisodium citrate that the actual article we read recommended. And we actually got the solution to turn yellow. And in order to keep it yellow, we actually put it in the ice bath. And these are the results that we got. We use a spectrophotometer to record our data. The spectrophotometer um, measures concentration, transmittance, and absorbance. Concentration is the amount of particles present in the solution. Transmittance is the percent of light that passes through the solution. And absorbance, which is measured in absorbance units, is the amount of light that is absorbed inside the particles. We also did an experiment where we actually took a drop of water and let it dry on a glass slide and then we placed it under the Zeiss microscope, and what we found was the actual pond water is a lot bigger than the ring for the actual filtered water. 
We also took SEM images of a film. Here we see the film with just a solution. As you can see, it's just a film right now, but in this image, you have all these red dots surrounding the entire solution. Those are, those are silver nanoparticles, and they are scattered across the entire solution. And here, we have it with the pond water. Again, you don't see much of a difference. But not only do we have silver nanoparticles, but we also have chloroline and calcium, which are both naturally would present in water. Chloroline are the green dots, and the calcium are the blue dots. For our future endeavor, if we had more time and resources, what we would like to do is actually do a bacterial test where we would place the foam in an incubator and see if they would cause these sort of inhibition, which would clear that it was antibacterial. And another thing that we would also like to do is try to add a malnutrition part into it. That way, someone in a developing nation not only gets properly hydrated, but has the nutrients they need to survive. Thank you for your time. I'd like to turn things over to KT Technologies. Good evening, I'm Keith Earl, and I'm Tyler Gillette, and we're at KT Tech. By show of hands, how many of you have experienced a concussion or know someone who's experienced a concussion? <laughs> I see there's a lot of hands. Me and Keith both play for of so this topic hits close to home. What is a concussion? A concussion is a brain injury that is caused by a bump blow or jolt to the head. It also can be caused by a hit to the body that causes the brain to shift rapidly within the skull, such as whiplash. In this quick clip, it'll show you what exactly happens when a person is concussed. And this IV. Many people say concussions are mild because they aren't life-threatening or someone can recover from a concussion, but those who have experienced it may think differently. Um, many long-term symptoms of concussion can be uh, dizziness, drowsiness, uh, irritability, and constant headaches, and also a person just doesn't feel the same after a concussion. 1.6, 3.8 million. That's the number of concussions on a yearly basis experienced by all sports. 64 to 76.8% is a number that represents the amount of concussions per 100,000 athletes in football alone, and this number is the highest of all sports. Before we had to uh, research our own uh, knowledge or go into that, we had to know what was out there already on the market and the current technologies used on the football field. So the two main companies that use their uh, technologies on the field are Rydell and Shut. So first, Rydell, uh, they, they have, they use uh, polycarbonate outer shell, and, uh, which is strong and durable. The th uh, they have four helmets out there on the market. Uh, the first one not on the screen is uh, the Revolution, which is their first product uh, made in 2002. Um, and that was the first uh, step towards preventing um, concussion toll on the players. The next helmet was only it was a speed, built for uh, uh, fit and comfortability, and it was also built for show. The 360 was built for uh, frontal and side impacts, 
And so you can also see that on the inside of the helmet, it, uh, it added more padding and uh, to the front and to the sides. The next was in the most recent helmet they made is the Speed Flex, and it's used in state of the state of the art technologies, and it uh, combines the previous technologies of the of the previous helmets. To the shut, all right. So the shut also uh, also uses a polycarbonate outer shell, which is uh, strong and durable, like I said before, um, and it also features uh, uh, a single layer of TPU thermoplastic polyurethane. So the six helmets they have are the Air XP Pro, Vengeance Pro, the Air XP Pro VTT2, the Vengeance DCT, the Vengeance VTD2, and the Vengeance Z10. Our goal this year was to find a material that could dissipate or absorb the impact of a force because, quite frankly, the helmets that they're using, that they were using today aren't really working because the athletes are still getting concussed. Um, finding those materials, we used methods like drop testing and Arduino software to uh, come up with data on what materials dissipated the most and uh, what materials were the best for us to use going forward. So like Tom said, we used the force sensor and with that comes with the LabQuest 2 to uh, measure the uh, amount of output force uh, from the drop test, which is shown in the middle of the screen. To the left, uh, the left picture is our Twino, Adreno circuit, which, uh, which measures the amount of uh, resistance that uh, a tab that we use uh, has. And then the, to the right are the tabs that we use, uh, the resistors itself. Okay, so with the drop testing with our, our research, we found out that with a six Newton uh, ball, uh, we found out that Sorbethane 30 durability uh, was the best one uh, and had, it showed that it was the, the least amount of output force. And the same data pretty much showed for the eight Newton ball, except the numbers are higher because it's a heavy ball. These are SEM images of the, of the materials we use to drop tests on. These three right here are the polyurethane that we shared with MT Bioscience, and then the top one is the sorbitane. So what's next? Um, we hopefully want to pass down our research to someone, because... <laughs> but, um, pass down our research to someone, maybe someone in the engineering academy that also plays football. It is for a warning, however, that no helmet specifically can prevent a concussion. Only the materials within the helmet uh, can de decrease its toll on players. So that was our goal in the beginning, is to find a material that uh, features a high, high dissipation absorbent prop uh, absorption properties um, and to decline the rate of concussions in sports. Um, and within research that was most recent, I found out that most companies use linear testing to test their uh, equipment. Uh, I think, like Tyler said before in the, in the earlier in this presentation, that whiplash is more is more common now to uh, experience concussions, and that is due to the fact that the head is joggling back and forth. So the best way to test the concussion right now, I believe, um, is that there are rotational impact testing. So uh, instead of a force directly impacting the helmet from a linear point of view, is to uh, is to uh, test the helmet. Uh, back and forth and see how uh, it is. Thank you, and we'll now pass it down to uh, Kiki. Good evening, everyone. My name is Siobhan Actor. This is Jeremy Pulver and Grant Prochkowski, and this is the PPA Sun Science team. Approximately 22 million workers are injured <clears throat> at a work area due to noise, noise, um, noise hazard levels, and $242 million is spent annually on workers' compensation. While sound is an asset to communication, its negative effects can be disturbing and in some cases damaging. 
Sound pollution can be commonly seen in settings such as industrial parks, public areas, and highways. Our purpose for research this year was to discover a soundproof nanofiber, and we wanted to test the properties of electrospun nanofibers. Right here we have a picture of us doing the calculations to create a PCL 20% 80,000 molecular weight nanofiber. Right here we are adjusting the voltage uh, to use the electrospin station. Then here is a picture of the actual sample, and we actually have a beaded stream back to the syringe pump. And here is the same image of that same polymer solution under the Zeiss microscope. Sound is not a physical object. It is very hard to deal with and even harder to test. It is a vibrational waveform that moves and you cannot see it with your naked eye. And because of that, we developed the impedance tube. And with the impedance tube, we have a speaker on the left and a vernier sound sensor, and one on the left and one on the right. We put our nanofiber sample in the middle to test it and see the decibel drops in between the vernier sound sensors. So the North Penn Educational Foundation gave our program a grant which we used to purchase uh, many pieces of equipment, one of them being these vernier sound sensors that we used in the impedance tube. The uh, vernier sound sensors can uh, be used to precisely get a decibel rating of sound down to a tenth of a decibel. Uh, what we have here is one of them, the MakerBot 3D printers. Uh, we have a couple at North Penn. Uh, we use them with our teacher, Mr. Reichwan, and we use this same inventor program in the class we took with him, which was IED. After realizing that shape has tremendous effects on sound, we developed a custom collection plate. And with the custom collection plate, we spun nanofibers on top of it. And after that, we also made a press plate to press down the nanofibers while we were spinning. So the nanofibers will coat the uh, custom collection plate perfectly. We also made a clamshell to remove the nanofibers from top of the custom collection plate and perfectly, perfectly fit it inside the impedance tube to test the nanofibers. So what you're looking at here is a graph of the impedance tube data that we actually got from our sound tests of these samples. The nanofiber samples were very efficient at canceling sound at some frequencies, whereas others they were not and actually amplified sound. Um, also, we tested a industry-proven sound cancellation material in our tube, and they were much greater than the nanofibers that we had. What you have here is the industry standard STC graph. This is where we actually got the 19 uh, different frequencies we tested uh, the samples and the impedance tube at. If we had more time for future endeavors, we would have loved to work with automobile and aviation companies to develop a soundproof nanopaint and a soundproof insulation to keep the outside world out and keep the peace and tranquility of your home inside. Thank you. Now we'd like to bring in Delta Phase. simple systems, our HVACs, or our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units. That's what costs us all the money. We also sometimes use air conditioning units that we put in like our windows, and that would keep your room cool. Or maybe use a fan to push around cool air to keep a room cool. And there's also ice packs, which you might throw in like a lunchbox to keep your sandwich nice and cold. But ice packs are a little bit special. So ice packs are actually a phase change material. So phase change materials are actually, you can compare them to an M&M. &M. So with an M&M, &M, if you hold that in your hand and it heats up, the inside chocolate will melt, but the outside shell will stay solid. 
So this is how a phase change material works. Like in the ice pack, the outside shell of the ice pack stays solid while the inside liquid melts. So in a phase change material, like a small sphere like this, the inside core material will melt as the temperature in the room increases, taking the energy out of the air and melting the core material. As uh, Delta Phase Enterprises, we wanted to improve on this instead of a shell or a spherical formation like this. We wanted to create a phase change material in a nanofiber by core sheath electrospinning, like uh, Nanomedical talked about, by having one nanofiber inside of another, where the inside nanofiber would be the core material, the outside shell being the sheath. To successfully core sheath a nanofiber, we needed to do something called coaxial electrospinning, which is succeeded by having one needle within another needle. So that allows one polymer to pull the other, all the way to the collection plate, to have a fiber within a fiber. To achieve that, we took one syringe and put inside another one. It was really that simple. But our issue with our design was that it was cheap plastic and it moved around a lot. It wasn't very efficient. So we decided to buy a Randy Hart needle, which was metal, rigid. Metal was perfect, not only was it rigid so it wouldn't move, the alignment stayed perfect, but also conducted really, really well, allowing our solution to be pulled very easily. Here we have the attached tubes to syringe pumps, allowing it to flow to create our polymer. In our research, we used three different microscopes. To the left, we have an image taken from an optical microscope, and we basically just used that to confirm that we were making nanofibers. In the middle, we have an SEM image, but we try to use that to confirm if we had core sheath or not, but one of the problems with an SEM is that it only analyzes the surface of the material, so we couldn't see through one fiber and see if there was a, the core inside. To do that, we had to use a TEM, or Transmission Electron Microscope, and this actually punches electrons through the material so that we can see our core inside the other one. Special thanks to Drexel and Dr. Craig Johnson for running our samples on the TEM. We, special thanks for taking his time and uh, getting these amazing images for us where you can clearly see that our fibers are our core sheath with the core material inside of the shell. So in order to test our phase change material, we run some thermal analysis in order to see how effective it was. So on the top here, you can see on the top left, thanks to Mr. Reichwein for 3D printing these, this, closed, this closed box we could use with a uh, power resistor in there to heat up our closed system in order to affect our change in temperature and see how well the material acted under a different temperature. So what we did is we increased the voltage going through that resistor heating up the enclosure and using three different thermocouples, measuring the temperature of the resistor itself, the ambient temperature of the box, and the temperature of our sample. Now, for our, or for our uh, thermal analysis, the graphs that we would like to see were similar to that phase change diagram there, where at, as the phase change occurs, temperature is actually constant over that time period. For uh, us to have, or have a good phase change material, there should be that level off at where the phase change occurs. Here are our graphs that we found in our samples. On the left here is our analysis of our core material by itself, octadecane. So on the bottom graph, or bottom line, the blue line there, you can see where the temperature is leveled off over that time <coughs> period and actually slightly decreases due to the phase change of, uh, of the material, pulling energy out of the air and keeping a constant temperature despite the resistor going up at its constant, mostly constant rate. On the right is our, the test of our core sheet sample, where you can see two small level offs where the, we believe the phase change occurred. It was hard to tell these are very small points, but we believe that that proves that the core sheet material was pulling energy out of the air and being an effective phase change material. The TEM was very important in our research but if we had more chances to analyze samples with it, we believe that we could proceed even further with our research, and that would help us go even further. Another thing that we lacked was the DSC, or a differential scanning calimeter. This is a machine that precisely measures thermal material properties, which we would have used on our PCM to correctly analyze it. And of course, one of the big time constraints is time, and the other being money. Had we had those, we probably would have tried to make our PCM alter um, the temperature change phase, the, rate that, the time of change, so that way we could have it alter from like 80 degrees to 76, so you can be comfortable whatever temperature you want to be at. Thank you.
We will now be handing it off to EPICS members for their talk about the NASA research. <laughs> Meanwhile, Temple University had a payload failure when another experiment leaked and ended up damaging Temple's experiment. And this prompted Montgomery County Community College to contact Ethics to see if we can research new methods of developing new ways to protect electronics. So our problem statement this year was that when electronics get wet, they tend to malfunction. So back in 2013, Montgomery County Community College began their research on hydrophobic materials. So they began with Ultra Everdry, which is a two-part coating. And then just recently, this past summer, they, they started testing three new ones. Uh, two of them are lacquer coatings. They're named Super Corona Dope and Acrylic. And the last one they tried out was Gen 2, which is an experimental military coating. So here at North Penn, we make use of electrospinning. Electrospinning is the process of passing a high voltage through a syringe filled with liquid polymer. And that polymer jets out and, and creates a fabric that ends up on a ground connected plate. The reason we electrospin is because it's very precise and the mass to strength ratio of nanofibers is very good. So here's a closer up image of the electrospin process. Um, the alligator clip is applying the electrical charge to the tip of the needle, which causes the polymer to jet out onto this ground plate that has an electric charge to collect the poly nanofibers. And before we can electrospin, we have to prepare the polymer. And to do that, we take prior calculations and we measure out the percent concentration for the solute and solvent, and we mix them with magnetic stir bars. The polymer we chose this year, based off of other hydrophobic research, was PCL, PMMA, and PVDF. So these are examples of our results. The way we tested hydrophobicity was by dropping a single droplet of deionized water onto the nanofibers and then we analyzed it in a software called MSJ. We analyzed contact angle, which is ideally 120 <coughs> degrees, 40 degrees, and we did that by measuring from the bottom of the droplet of water to the outermost edge. Prior research has it that PMMA would perform the best, however, it didn't, and we actually have polycapolite to perform the best. So this is a more in-depth um, anal analysis of PCL, and as you can see, there is no clear definitive trend between the concentration and the contact angle, so we would have to conduct more tests next year to see if we can fill that little gap and create equivalent. <coughs> so for what's up next, as Angie said, we want to do different concentrations in between the 10 and the 20% concentrations for PCL, since it was the most promising. We also want to figure out new ways of electrospinning to optimize the research that we've, we've done so far. We also want to see if we can make it portable so we don't have to do it in the lab, maybe just on the spot waterproofing. And lastly, we want to apply our research to actual electronics, spin directly to them, and submerge them to see if they actually work. Thank you guys for coming out today, and we're going to hand it off to Mr. Boyer. I hope you had a, a wonderful, enjoyable evening for the first half of the presentations uh, here in the Audion. We will be moving shortly down to the Auxiliary Gymnasium where the students will be able to give you examples of their research and actually see their research in action. However, first I would like to, especially for all the families here to see, can I have all of these seniors up on stage, please? I'd like you to see the graduating seniors of the 2016 North Penn High School Engineering Academy in a second as they come up here. Do we also have any tech ed department members here? I'm looking to see, trying to see if Dr. Wojciech and Mr. Reichmann, can you guys come up here please? I know you don't want to and I apologize for putting you through this, but you have to come up. Um, 
I am just one man in the department of five. And so we have a couple of men who are here to come with us. And without the work that these amazing guys do with their students, they wouldn't be able to do the stuff you see up here. So I am so humbled to work with these guys who are experts in their field as well. And just, um, we thank you. So they've gone through them, their courses as sophomores and juniors, so that way I can work them, with them as seniors. So I get to glean all the glory. And, and unfortunately, these are the guys that do the heavy work. So thank you so much for all of you guys. make it here. Um, Mr. Michael in particular. Uh, is here? Where's Mr. Michael? Mr. Michael, get up here. You need to get up here. Please, 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 please. Mr. Michael is the glue in the department. He is the man who's been leading and steering the ship for, for many, many years here at North Penn. And um, we just want to thank him for all of his hard work as a department chair. And Bill, I am, I am going to say he is retiring this year, and I want to say thank you for all that you've done for our students. And our I would also like to call up real quickly as well, JJ Ramon and Stephen Yost as well, if you can come up to the front, please. These were uh, a student and professor at Drexel University who worked with the Epics Club, who was in year one of a three-year project. And because of JJ and Steven's work this year, the students who were juniors, by the way, that presented from the Epics Club, will now be presenting again next year as seniors up on stage in EDD and Epics again. So they've been kind of prepared. And I thought they did a really wonderful job as well. So thank you for your work. I wish you guys the best of luck in your future endeavors as you continue on to your engineering fields or whatever fields you guys get into. And don't forget us down here at North Penn as you guys move on to bigger and better things. Before you finish. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we'd like to thank Mr. Boyer for he spent he spends all his time with us. He was here at five in the morning for us. He has been here on over six hours on the weekend for us, just to make us, or help, here for us to help us do research. He spent his own money, his own time, he's spending his family time here. So we'd like to present Mr. Boyer with a Amazon gift card for your, you and your family, not for research. <laughs> because we noticed that you're only using this as a North Penn Engineering, so we've got one embroidered with Mr. Michael Boyer on it. Uh, nice and sexy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I have to say, yes, that is true. I'm here at 5 in the morning, many mornings, but it's because they tell me to. <laughs> So like, Boyer, can you come in early? I'm like, how early do you want to show up? If they say 5, 5.15, I'm like, you got it. Can you believe it? I mean, this is awesome. And these guys are graduating in, what, eight days? This is amazing. So congratulations again to our seniors. I want to let you know, we're going to head down to the auxiliary gymnasium for snacks, food, and interaction with all of the students. Again, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, this uh, film, man. Okay, so what we have here is a, a magnesium air fuel cell. And what it does is it takes temperatures and humidity and it, a, a lot of like weather stuff. Okay. We wired it all together. Uh, did a number on the computer. And what we were going to do if we had more time was we were going to uh, embed it in the helmet. And then... To uh, prove the efficiency of the effectiveness of the trigger. And also micro scaffolds and 